on this edition of the Self Publishing Show. So now I'm just like Greco wrestling with this guy, and then I look over and I feel it, and his hands on my gun. I... I'm like, this guy wants to kill me. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. This Christmas edition 2019. Mark and I have made an effort, haven't we? We have. Well, yes, you've got a Star Wars Christmas jumper and I just have a Christmas jumper. But yes, I think you probably win today. Uh, I win the um, the Christmas Joy Award. But you've been to a nativity play, which is a very sweet thing to do. Well, as we record this, yes, we we're some way before Christmas, a couple of weeks, and I just got back from my daughter's nativity play, which was very lovely, as these things always are, and um, highlighted this year by um, Freya's kind of one of the older kids in, in the nativity, so she was just a sheep, um, a very enthusiastically sh- singing sheep. But the uh, the star of the show was probably um, <laughs> Mary and Joseph, who were about four, maybe even about three, both started crying and had to go to their parents, just leaving the donkey. So uh, the donkey, he was, was a very enthusiastic dancer and singer and an empty crib. There's probably a message there somewhere, but um, yeah. it was yeah. it was it was lovely. A metaphor for something. Um, it's quite a brave decision in your daughter's school where the older children take a background role and and they give the four year olds the starring role because that is you know inevitably going to lead to the sort of chaos you witnessed this afternoon. Yeah, but it was very, it was very charming chaos uh, with lots of um, lusty singing and um, and yes, enthusiastic dancing. So yeah, we and that was just the parents. So it was it was uh, it was lovely. Good. Well, excellent. Well, my kids are too old for nativity plays now, so I don't get to do that anymore. We did rather enjoy it um, in its day. Right. Before we do anything else, let me welcome to our Patreon supporters. Uh, A few have joined us recently. I'm going to do them in two batches. I'm going to do half of them in this episode and half of them next episode. So if you don't hear your name uh, in this episode, you'll hear it next week, the other side of Christmas. So we're going to say a very warm welcome to Margot Dill from MO USA. It must be Missouri. Or Montana. Or Montana. I think it's Missouri. I think it I've is actually them. it is actually Montana because I checked beforehand. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, Josh, I knew you'd Missouri. ask me, so I like to I like to um, yeah make sure I'm ready. Because Michigan is MI, isn't it? Yes, and it's Michigan. So what's Missouri then? MS. MS. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Are you certain? Okay, you can go out well, and we'll get we'll get angry <laughs> comments if you're Google, wrong. Google was certain. Um, Google. Of course, I may have searched incorrectly, but yeah, it seemed to be Montana. Okay. So we think Margot Dill is in uh, Montana. Might be Missouri. David Maxwell is in Cragmore, Australia. Sounds a great name in Australia. Uh, Carl Artman, uh, also welcome, welcoming Jin Holland. And also for this episode, welcoming Lynn Davis. And we have a few people to welcome in the next episode, if you didn't hear your name there. You can go to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing formula. We're very grateful for those of you who uh, support the podcast, the self-publishing show in that way. And you get lots of goodies. You get lots of free training. We have an Instagram live session coming up in January. will be the next one on that uh, platform which we're looking forward to and talking of which training we've been busy in the background have we not mark in fact as we speak in a huge batch one by one uh, the facebook advanced facebook ads for authors course is being delivered out to existing students uh, of the advertising for authors course as a bonus they weren't even aware was coming probably um, probably not. I have been waffling on about it a little bit on webinars and things, or should I say webinars, which we, we can mention yes. that in a moment. Um, uh, yeah, so um, it's not quite finished yet, so I'm basically adding to it as we go along. So they've they've got about an hour and a half's worth of content that we've edited and, and put live in the Teachable School, um, and there'll be more coming up. I'm, I'm looking at campaign budget optimization at the moment, which is, is quite a hot topic, so there'll be... Um, I was doing slides for that yesterday. This, that's going to be a long session, I'm warning you now. Um, and what else? We've done some testing stuff. We've got some kind of keyword research. Um, in you know, we're looking for targets with interest being a bit more difficult to use these days. We've got some alternatives on that score as well. So um, that's gone up. And we also, because it's Christmas, we also gave everyone a YouTube course as well. So um, that was the uh, YouTube for Authors course that we 
also sent out at the same time, which is also great. Um, so yeah. there are people, we're getting nice emails from people saying, that's very kind. I didn't know yeah. that you were going to do that. And, um, you know, that's just, that's kind of how we roll. That's how we roll. It's Christmas. It is Christmas. And um, we can't, I wish we could announce what we're working on in the background as well, but we can't. Uh, apart from to say that it involves Amazon ads and our course, which is already pretty good, um, could well will be the best in the world potentially if we can um, we can pull this off. So there's there's a few moving parts and interesting people, interested people are probably listening to the podcast right now. So I'm not going to say too much more than that, but um, we are very excited about what might might be coming in 2020. Yeah, we're working hard in the background there. Um, good. Okay, look, we are going to move on to our interview. Now, I have to say, it's not particularly Christmassy, this interview, although it's a kind of Christmassy in a diehard sort of way. Mm. That diehard is a Christmas movie. Um, so our interviewee today is Patrick O'Donnell. And now I've bumped into Patrick uh, several times at conferences and chatted to him. He's a lovely guy. Um, very interesting. He writes a bit of nonfiction, but a bit of fiction. And... Most uh, significantly about Patrick, uh, in addition to being a writer, he is a street walking cop. He's so a street he's a uni- walker. It's a street walker, not that. I don't think he is, <laughs> but he probably knows them. <laughs> but he's um, he's a uniformed uh, cop. Actually, I think he leads teams now. Uh, and from memory, it's Milwaukee, I think, where he is, and he's been doing it. Um, gosh, for most of his life, you'll hear all of the details in the uh, the podcast interview itself in a minute. But he is a man who grew up in the police forces seen everything he's been in districts where there are shootings every day of the week and fatal shootings every other day i think were the the stats Uh, and that's something he's been dealing with now that is gold dust for people like you in fact mark who write uh in that kind of area to hear not just other thriller writers ideas of what cops are like but somebody who themselves is in the dark blue uniform with the Mm. silver badge doing it every day and and the interview did get a little a bit a little bit into my old uh, sort of reporter came out of me asked him how it felt and you know whether he was nervous about it and uh, there is this sort of slightly poetic thing hanging over that he's days away from retirement at the moment so obviously we mm-hmm. wish him um safe uh, last few weeks in his job yeah so i do think i'll say to that so if he's bumped into you several times at conferences i think you have to ask yourself <laughs> if, if that really was a coincidence or whether you're possibly under investigation for, for something we won't we won't go into what that could be um the and the other thing was you know um it's milwaukee yeah whatever i live in salisbury you know it's yeah uh, i i take his milwaukee and raise him a salisbury um i don't hear any novichok um incidents being dealt with anywhere else in the world but no i'm, I'm obviously i'm being very slightly flippant there um it is there's it's a i'm looking for, i haven't heard this interview so i'm looking forward to to listening to that and um I am. We might talk about this af- afterwards. Um, in fact, we will talk about it afterwards. So yeah. just so you remember, um, because I'll forget otherwise, um, we're going to talk about how I'm using the police uh, when yes. it comes to my new Atticus book. But with that, um, I'm going to do the, the segue today. Let's, uh, let's jump to the interview. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Patrick O'Donnell, welcome to the self-publishing show. Well, thank you so much for having me. Hey, and I'm really excited actually to have you on the show because we've chatted, uh, has to be said, usually over a beer quite late at night in various locations around the world. Yes, we have actually. Uh, And here we are actually in Las Vegas (laughs) recording this at another writer's conference. But um, just, first of all, I'm a huge fan of your dedication to writing, your career change at the moment, which is coming toward the end of the main career that you've had. Um, but it's also gripping listening to you talking about being on the front line as a as a cop um, <laughs> for so many years, and so that's really what I want to talk a bit about. That because I think people, a lot of people write in this genre. A yes. lot of people write about the police, the, the FBI, um, and so on. And to hear some truths about the reality of it, I think would be useful today. But also, I want to talk to you about your your career change as a writer. So, how's that sound? Sounds grand. Okay, it won't be like one of your interrogations. Yeah. <laughs> It's going to be gentle. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let's start off. Why don't you tell us a bit about your your career in uniform? I started in January 16, 1995. I went to the police academy, and I went to a large city police academy. There's a couple of different ways here in the States that you can become a police officer. Larger cities like New York, Chicago, L.A. have their own police academies, and they're usually about six months long. And if you get a job as a police officer in a smaller jurisdiction, there's vocational schools 
that have police academies. And usually a department will either pay you to go to the academy or you put yourself through, you pay yourself. What's, and the, the, what's the split out of people who are self-funding or being paid through? The... You know what? It's probably about 50-50. Okay. But that's just a guess off the top of my yeah. head because that's not my world. Right. So how old were you at this stage? 30 years old. 30. So, so I got on a little bit later on in life. So you'd been doing other stuff until that point? Yes, sir. And was the police something you always wanted to do, or was it just something that had occurred to you later on? It was in the back of my head. As a young person, I grew up in Chicago, and <laughs> I remember the police were doing a search warrant on the house next to us. Okay. And that's with their SWAT team. You know, there's uh, two officers in our backyard with a shotgun and an M16. That's an automatic rifle. Yeah, yeah. And they breach the door with the big ram and they're pulling people out and there's a big commotion and you know the houses in Chicago are about that close together so I had a front row seat and I'm just like wow that looks really cool <laughs> I think that'd be fun to do when I grow up you know so I wound up going to college I started out as a music major okay but then I quickly transitioned over to uh, sociology and my minor was criminal justice right and what really got me going was I did an internship with a sheriff's department with the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Department. And that's a bigger sheriff's department. And I was in the mix of everything. I worked in the jail, I was on the street. And for a college kid, I, I thought that it was fantastic. Lots of ride-alongs. Oh yeah, every day was a ride-along. Unless I was in the jail, then you're stuck in the jail. Yeah. But wow. that was interesting to see also. Yeah. So you're 30 years old, you go to, uh, did you self-fund or did you get paid through? Um, for big city departments like that, they pay you. Okay. So you go through Police Academy, mm -hmm. and was it in those, because I imagine for some people after the first couple of weeks, they might discover it's not for them, or this is definitely for them. Was it for you, you thought, I'm fitting in here? Oh, I right away, I'm just like, yeah, I really enjoy this. It's very, back then it was very militaristic. You know, you fell in for inspection every morning. You know, you had a sergeant in front of you checking you out from the top of your head down to your shoes. You know, if there was a piece of lint on your uniform, you got written up right. or everyone's doing push-ups. Yeah, so that type of thing. It was, it was very structured, but there was some humor. Some, after a while, the instructors loosened up a little bit. You kind of got to get to know them. And it was, the camaraderie was really good because my academy class was 42 people. Usually it's about 60. It was just an anomaly that was a little bit smaller. But when you have a large group of people going through a tough thing, you know, you kind of yeah. band together. You bond. Mm -hmm. So you go through the academy training, and at that point, the 42 of you, do you all get split up, or do you stay with some of those guys? Um, the city that I work in, there's seven police districts, and you start in one of those police districts. Okay. I do wanna... you choose that? Or they no. Have... Okay. Now, these days these days, um, they let the officers put in a request. That doesn't always mean they're going to get what they request, but that's just our department. Every department does it differently. Okay. I wound up in one of the worst neighborhoods, the most violent neighborhood in the city. And this is Milwaukee? or Yes, it was the city of Milwaukee. And the thing about it was, I, um, and I didn't know Milwaukee. I was living in Madison at the time, and I, I knew how to get downtown. But you know, they gave me the address, go report at you know, District 5, and I'm like, okay. I'm looking around, I'm like, hmm, this is an interesting neighborhood. Yeah. So there was probably about 10 of us out of my academy class that got sent to that district station. So tell us about, in those few years, pacing the streets in District 5 in Milwaukee, tell us what a day was like then. It was, it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. When you say great, because there was always something going on, yeah. always. Um, I started out on early shift, which was four in the afternoon till midnight. And you go through field training. You go through two six week blocks of field training. And you have a field training officer that you ride with that more or less shows you the ropes. You know, they teach you how to write your reports properly, officer safety issues, how to drive the car properly what to do, okay, you're in this situation, this is what you should be doing. So you you rely heavily on your FTO, your field training officer, when you're new. So a little bit of street wiseness as well, I imagine, yes. that they've picked up and how to spot. Because I, I remember seeing some 
fascinating posters in the background in police stations when I was doing my BBC reporting days uh, on things like how to anticipate an assault. And it gave some sort of key behaviour indicators. Sometimes people would calm right down just before they, because they were planning. And yeah, I'm thinking there's a lot of, a lot of just as a policeman standing around in a group that's, you're aware of attitudes changing and stuff. And I guess this older guy is the person who's been around the block a bit and is passing that on. Absolutely. You get good at reading people's body language. And, you know, after you've been through it a few times, you know, the thousand mile stare, you know, right. somebody's just like staring right through you, you know, things aren't going to go great. He's not very happy about going to jail tonight. Um, and then obvious things like people balling their fists, okay. if they're relaxed and you start talking to them and they know the inevitable, the handcuffs are going to come out and they're going to go to jail. There's a thing called resistive tension where the shoulders kind of cinch up. They start balling up their fists and it's like, all right, this guy wants to fight. Or some will just start talking nonsensically to you and they keep looking over your shoulders and they look around. They're looking for an escape route. Right. So you're already with your rugby tackle or NFL tackle <laughs> or to defend yourself. Mm. I mean, you know what? Because I know some people who write in this genre will be interested in this level of detail and kind of the personal experience of that. So if you've got somebody in front of you and you've, can you tell us about any experiences where somebody has launched themselves at you? Yes. Um, I, I was an FTO. I was training somebody. I had a recruit. He was a very good recruit. He worked for the sheriff's department before he went to the city. So he had law enforcement experience and he was just very sharp. I knew he'd be a good officer and he's, he's a sergeant now. So he's done real well for himself. And we get sent to a boy girl trouble like at 6 30, 7 o'clock in the morning. We were working midnight to eight and it was in one of the city's projects. And we get there and there's a very large man arguing with his girlfriend. And the girlfriend's mom is there and everyone's screaming at each other. And we're like, all right. So we start talking, we separate them. And we still don't know actually what we have because somebody else called. They didn't call the police. Hey, everything okay? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I could just tell there was something wrong. I couldn't put it into words. So I went behind him. When you search people or pat them down, I didn't have enough to arrest this person right now. But I could do a pat down for weapons. So I started patting him down. I said, just relax, sir. I'm behind him. I'm just, I'm just going to pat you down for weapons. Do you have anything on you that you shouldn't? And right away, the shoulders went up. He got real resistive. The resistive tension was going. He was shaking. He was just cinching up so hard. And this all happened like within two seconds, maybe. He spun around and he tried to tackle me. And then I, I just lowered my center of gravity because I'm not very tall. He was about 6'4", six, 6'5". He was probably a good 260. He had a prison build. Well, I didn't know it, but he just got out of prison. Right. <laughs> I, been I didn't know once. it at the time. Oh, yeah, he was huge. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, so now I'm just like Greco wrestling with this guy. And then I look over and I feel it and his hand's on my gun. Oh. And I'm like, this guy wants to kill me. So your brain goes into survival mode and you're like, okay, you go caveman. And I remember I just lifted up underneath his chin and I hit his head up against a mailbox. There was big metal ba mailboxes attached oh, so to the you building. Outside at this stage, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. this is all outside. And I kept on hitting his head until his body went limp. <laughs> and he was just. I don't a know why I'm laughing at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, yeah. then you know we do our homework, yeah. and he was on parole for armed robbery, and he broke his conditions of parole. He already had a hearing. He was going back to prison. Yeah. So my trainee and I were the only things standing between him. And going back to prison. Yeah, because he could have shot you and gone on the run. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, later on, they talked to him. That's what he intended to do. Right. And just uh, some technical details. So your gun, I'm assuming, has some sort of strap over it. or Yeah, it, there's yeah. different models of holsters. You can't just reach and pull a gun out of a... Right. But in prison, they actually practice this. Right. They practice, you know, disarming police officers. Right. So... Good to know. And I could tell he had practice. I mean, yeah. there was one thing on his mind. It was just one of those instances where I could have done a number of things and it would have been okay. Yeah. I'm just glad it turned out all right. Yeah. And your uh, trainee at that point had an interesting oh, int yeah. introduction. <laughs> <to> yes, <laughs> he did. I made him write all the reports yeah. as a good field training officer should. And yeah. uh, he did an outstanding job because, like I said before, he was a sheriff's deputy who worked in the jail. And they fight with people quite a bit in a jail surrounding because they have no weapons. Right. So you have to rely mostly on what you say, 
90% of law enforcement is how you talk to people. I could diffuse a lot of situations where somebody's up here, they're drunk, they're high, they're, they're pissed off about this, that, or the other thing. But it's all, it's all how you talk to people. And, but there are instances where all the talking in the world isn't going to do anything. Yeah. And when, just in this incident, you've presumably got the other two, like the girlfriend screaming at you at this oh, point. Oh, yeah. Because the, they're the going to be, be and, riled. And... Yep. Mom and uh, daughter were both screaming at the top of their lungs. But your focus was on. Oh, I didn't know anything else was going on. Yeah. I didn't hear them. Because when you have an adrenaline dump like that, there's certain physiological things that happen to you. You get tunnel vision. The same thing happens if you're chasing a car. In a squad car, you're in a, involved in a vehicle pursuit. You get tunnel vision. It's really hard to see out of the, the sides of your eyes. You, your hearing goes way down. I, it's funny because at the end of a vehicle pursuit, you know, most of them wind up in some kind of foot chase. Either the bad guy crashes or he runs out of gas or he just pulls over and then he takes off. I've secured officers' cars and... The siren is blaring. The radio is up all the way. And they're like, it wasn't up that high, Sarge. I'm like, actually, it was up all the way. But that's what happens to your body. Yeah. That focus. Yep. Um, and you're uh, afterwards, an incident like that, obviously, you're, you're shaken up. You're, oh, yeah. Your adrenaline's going. Absolutely. And how does, two questions. First of all, do you do a formal debrief off an incident like that? Does the, your your sergeant or your commanding officer sit down with you and, and talk things through? Or do you sit there personally and think, did I, what decisions did I make with these good decisions? You know, the departments across the country are getting a little bit better at that. There should be more debriefing when it comes to a situation where you may have to take somebody's life because that was a deadly force issue. It was, for me, it was like, okay, get a, a wagon came, he regained consciousness. We got a medical attention. Off to the hospital he went. He got a bunch of stitches and a CAT scan. And to jail he went. And go write your reports. That was that. That was that. But as a police officer, you replay these things in your head over and over. And you keep thinking to yourself, well, I could have done this. I should have done that. I, but like I said, you have a couple of seconds to make these decisions. I guess your partnership with your... I mean, in this case, a younger guy, the trainee, mm -hmm. is important as well, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And how do you protect yourself from becoming traumatized by these things you're experiencing? <laughs> One of the things that most police officers have are a good sense of humor. And that's not just police, it's military. People who are in extreme situations, the more extreme the situation, the more humor there is. You know, there's the gallows humor. There's all kinds of joking. I mean, when it's work time, it's work time. You got to be serious. But when it's not, that's a real good pressure relief. For me, I like to work out. You know, physical exercise is huge. It, I'm, I'm working day shift now, so it's a lot easier to do. People working nights, it's difficult. You're married. You have children. You've got responsibilities. It's hard to fit in that workout, but somehow, some way, you got to squeeze it in. And now you're, you say, you alluded to the fact you're still working. You're, I think, how far from retirement as we Two months, two days. Okay. Um, and do you still get nervous when you go out on patrol? Are you out on patrol at the moment or are you in the yeah, office? Yeah, or... I'm a street sergeant. Okay. So I'm a patrol sergeant. I supervise the police officers that are on the street. So when something bigger occurs, I have to go. So if you, I have an armed robbery, sexual assault, um, a fire, shootings, uh, shots fired, uh, bank robbery, you, just anything big like that. You go out. And mm -hmm. do you get nervous still? I don't get nervous, but you do get, a, when the call comes over the radio, you do get a little bit of an adrenaline dump. I liken it to being on a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. When you're at the top and you're going down fast, your stomach kind of, at least, it's probably different for other people, but for me, that's what I feel like the last day before I went to Vegas, I got dispatched to a subject with a rifle in an um, alley. It's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm like, oh, man, I just want to go home. So like, there's a guy wearing a Green Bay uh, sweater and a black stocking mask with, they said, an assault-type rifle. I'm like, all right, let's go. Nice. So off we went. And how did that work out? Nobody there. Oh, just a report of that. Yep, there's a lot of that. People miss see things or somebody was genuinely there? A lot of people miss see things or 
It could be a call, say you're having a trouble with your wife or your husband, and they want the police to get there quicker. Oh, he's got a gun. Uh, okay. He's got a gun. Then you okay. get there and he's like, well, sometimes he's got a gun. Okay. Yeah, that type of thing. Right, but you, you don't know that until you get there. So just to talk about guns for a little bit, because I think in, in Milwaukee, you said to me in one conversation we were having before that, you, that shootings are unfortunately a fairly regular occurrence. Yes. When I was new in 1995, oh, that was the height of what we used to call the crack wars where it was probably about 140, 150 homicides a year for a city of 600,000. And we had close to four to 500 non-fatal shootings. Wow, so that's, a sh- that's more than one shooting every day <coughs> oh, on yeah. average and a murder mm-hmm. every couple of days. Yes. Okay. Um, and in terms of your weapon use, how many times and you know, how often was it an occurrence where you drew your weapon? When I worked there, it was every night, multiple times. Every night? Absolutely. So you're, you're aiming your weapon at someone, shouting mm-hmm. them to get down or whatever. Oh, absolutely. And, the rest. and they're armed sometimes? Sometimes. Drawing your weapon, using it to make an arrest, that's mm-hmm. an awesome responsibility. It is. I'm, the first time I had somebody come at me that was armed and I wasn't, I didn't know. It was the middle of winter and there was a squad chase. They're chasing somebody for something. And we had the perimeter, my partner and I. And that means you set up squads like in a one or two block radius where the person got out and ran. So you have choke points for hopefully you will see them when they try to run past you. That type of thing. While you have other officers, quote unquote, make the yards, go through searching for the bad guy. And it was three o'clock in the morning, something like that. I was working late shift. And uh, this guy was just walking at me. He was walking down the middle of the street. And I'm like, sir, get on the sidewalk. Didn't say a word, thousand miles stare. I'm like, sir, get off to the sidewalk, please. You're in the middle of the street. Didn't say, he just kept on coming at me. And I'm just like, what the? And I just got that really bad feeling. So I drew my gun and I'm just like, get your, he had his hands in his pocket. I'm like, get your hands out of your pocket now. I wasn't sure if this is the guy that they were chasing. I'm like, get your hands out of your pockets now. Let me see your hands. He's like, just shook his head, kept on coming at me, and I'm just like, oh. yeah. So I actually holstered my weapon and went hands on, and it was the fight was on immediately. He's going for the inside of his coat. Make a long story short, I decentralized him, which meant getting him on the ground. And my partner was smoking a cigarette and looking the other way. Oh, he didn't I even see. know what was going on at first. <laughs> I'm like, Tom, you want to help out here? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so, okay, buddy. So. <laughs> I hook him up, I handcuff him, then my partner comes over, we stand him up, and he still hasn't said a word. He had a 357 and a shoulder holster that he was going for. And his pockets were lined with crack cocaine. All right, so he was high. Oh. And he, and you made that decision because he got close enough for you to make, to yeah. do that with your hands. And right. it's it part of your thinking, this is an obvious thing to say, but you don't want to shoot somebody if you're going to avoid it, right? So there was another, there was an alternative for you you would have been probably justified in shooting him. I would have, him. but it's in everybody's DNA not to hurt people, not to especially take another life. I've been the uh, incident commander for seven different officer-involved shootings where an officers had to shoot and kill somebody. And every one of them, there's some similarities to all of them. And one of the biggest ones is that officer doesn't want to do that. Their hand was pushed. They didn't want to do it. And But... You have to do what you have to do sometimes. It's unfortunate. Have you ever shot anyone? No. Two I've been, months, two I've, days. <laughs> yeah, like touch, don't jinx me. <laughs> no, 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 touch wood. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, okay, so how? one thing you told me just as we were resetting the cameras was quite interesting about a statistic about the murders in Milwaukee. Well, through the years, you know, like I said, when I first got on, it was, it was real bad. You know, we were talking about 450, maybe 500 non-fatal shootings a year, about 140, 150 homicides. That has gone down. And one of the reasons the shootings have gone down, not tremendously, but the homicides have because emergency medicine has gotten much better in the last 25 years. And unfortunately, that's a byproduct of war sometimes. Good medical, you know, trauma medical technology comes out of, you know, it's 
It's necessity. Yeah. And war, war does tend to speed up invention, doesn't it? In all it, sorts of it areas. It does. Yeah. Just the invention of quick clot. Yeah. I don't know how many lives that has saved. What is that? It's um, either a gauze or like a um, gel that you can put on a wound and it will kind of coagulate the wound and it'll slow the rate of bleeding or stop the bleeding. So seal it. Oh, okay. Should get some of that in our back pocket. <laughs> you can get it at Walgreens. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, you haven't shot anyone, which is great. And um, I imagine your ability as a cop to read situations has played a big part in that. So, you know, it's a great um, credit to you. But you've probably lost some friends, I imagine, in a career that long in a city like Milwaukee. You know, right before I got on, an officer was shot and killed, and another one was uh, involved in a fatal car accident. And we went almost 24 years w without an officer dying. I've known officers that have been shot that have survived, quite a few actually. But unfortunately, we had two officers get shot and killed within six months. And another officer was involved in a uh, fatal car accident when he was chasing a kidnapping suspect. Something happened to a squad and it rolled out of control. He was ejected and killed instantly. And how did you cope with that? Well, I didn't know the officer that was in the vehicle accident. I mean, I'm very sad and I feel very bad for his family. But one of the officers that was shot and killed before was one of my guys when I worked. Uh, it was late power shift, 7 at night till 3 in the morning. I knew him pretty good. So that was real tough. Yeah. And partly uh, those, however horrific those incidents are, another opportunity to learn and examine. Are there any lessons you can take away? Is that one way of coping with it? it? It is. I mean, you don't think of that immediately. You know, you get angry. Mm -hmm. um, you get sad. You know, there's a lot of hard feelings with all that. But the police department has to keep going on. You know, I will retire in two months, God willing, and the Milwaukee Police Department, the Milwaukee Police Department isn't going to stop. You know, I was talking to another officer today, actually. One of the biggest mistakes that younger and sometimes even cops with time on is they fall in love with the job, and they get really hurt when they find out the job doesn't love them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't love them back because we're all replaceable, and we have to be, and that's from the chief all the way down because it can't stop. It's a service. Yes. Ultimately, it's a service. Um, how are you feeling about leaving? Because you talked about that humor, and I understand that, and I've been around the police a bit in my life and, mm -hmm. and the military as well, and I understand that. But suddenly you're going to be on the outside, and you're still going to have those memories and those occasions in your head. It, it's going to be an adjustment, for sure. And I've been thinking about it probably the last couple of years. And I've seen how some officers have left the police department and have done well. And I've seen some that have left and have done miserably. So I'm trying to learn from people's mistakes and what some of the biggest things to take away is your friend base, your little tribe can't be all cops because you are going to leave. Yeah, you can't lose everyone in one right, guy. Exactly. So I have friends and outside interests, just like this. Yeah. Nobody knows that I'm here. And when I tell them what this is, they look at me with a blank stare like, yeah. <laughs> the 20 what? Yeah, I'm like. Where's Patrick? Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> um, I should say that the dramatic incidental music is not us putting this in, <laughs> although it's a great interview. It's mm -hmm. uh, because in Vegas, there's this slightly surreal show that goes on outside our window every Vegas hour. Vegas is very good for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's if people can hear that. Um, well, look. Let's segue perfectly into Patrick O'Donnell Mark Two. Yeah. You know, well, I guess Mark Three because you were thirty when you joined the police, and here's another career change for you. So tell us about the writing. Oh, it's going really well, actually. I wrote a book called Cops and Writers from the Academy to the Street, and that's done very well. And then the second book is a sequel to that, Cops and Writers, Crime Scenes and Investigations. I just got my, the manuscript back from my editor. There's a bunch of work that I'm going to have to do on it, and I'm hoping to have that out before the end of this year. And I'm also consulting with authors, and I have a Facebook group, Cops and Writers, so it takes up a lot of my time. 
So this is the perfect book for people writing in this genre who want to get the police right. Correct. And have you included some of the personal stuff, the sort of thing I've been asking you about because I'm nosy, about <laughs> um, you know, not just the procedures, but what it feels like to the individual and what your experience? Yes. Yeah, I, I put in there, you know, it's like so one of the bigger mistakes is not developing a character. You know, your main character, either it's an extreme one way or the other. You know, cops are people. You know, it's, it's either a Martin Riggs that's from Lethal Weapon that's on the edge that's, you know, he's about to explode at any second, you know, or a real stoic stone face that has no sense of humor, you know, like a Joe Friday from the old Dragnets, you know, and it's like, it's kind of a combination of all those things. And there's a bunch of different personalities in a police department. Yeah, so give them some, the same sort of, because people are quite good when it comes to their main character to put the flaws in. Right. Uh, but, necess- but quite often the cop who comes along, I guess, is probably one dimensional. Yeah, often. yeah, and they don't develop the story. A lot of police books, movies, either start out with or early on in the story, they shoot and kill somebody. And usually it's a detective. You know, it's very detective you know, focused, where in reality, police officers and sergeants are the ones who usually wind up shooting and killing people because they're on the front lines. There's two different types of detectives. There's a suit and tie detective, we call, that goes out and investigates after everything is all done and over with. And there's also detectives that are in specialty units that are running with the cops also, and where something like that can definitely happen. But that's a much smaller number, so they get that wrong. And then as far as if you are unfortunate enough where you do have to shoot and shoot and kill somebody, there's going to be six months to a year you're going to be inside. You're not going to be outside the next day or that night, and you're certainly not going to be investigating the own, your own shooting. That's not going to happen. So in the UK, um, there's an organization that is automatically comes in, an independent body automatically comes in to investigate any police shooting. Is that a similar setup in the States? There's separate entities that come in for a police shooting. Um, where I work, an outside jurisdiction will come in and investigate the shooting. The district attorney's office will come in and investigate the shooting. Sometimes the state will come in and they all work together. And so there's a bunch of different eyes looking at the incident. And also there's two separate investigations that are going to occur. There's the criminal. If you shoot and kill somebody, technically that's a homicide. You know, 99.9% of the time it's a justifiable homicide, but it's still a homicide and you have to investigate it. If you're a police officer, the second investigation is going to be from the Internal Affairs Department. And that's going to be an investigation as to, did you follow our rules and procedures correctly, the SOP, et cetera, et cetera. So they're two very distinct and separate um, investigations. Which is why you need to know those procedures. I guess that's what you drum into your kids when they (laughs) they join you. Don't be found out afterwards. Yes. Um, We had Jerry Williams on, a former FBI agent. I like her. She's a nice, nice guy. She's great. Um, Yes. And she sort of explode, tried to explode the myth that whenever the FBI turn up, there's this war between jurisdiction war, that actually it was a much more cooperative relationship in reality. Would you go along with that? Yes. Um, if anything, most departments are going to be like, hey, you can have it if you want to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, big investigations are expensive. They tie a bunch of resources up. And a lot of times it's like, no, you, you can have that. I had a homicide where there was a person that was shooting somebody across the street into a different jurisdiction and the person died. So we both responded. And everyone's like, no, you can have it. That's okay. You can have it. And the other one's like, ah, there's no fight yours. to keep it. There's no, a fight to give it away. No. <laughs> As far as FBI goes, my experience, there's joint task forces. In a big city, they're not as hands-on as they would a smaller department because the smaller department doesn't have the resources or the experience. Whereas with us, I mean, I don't know, I told you about all the shootings, but we have a ton of robberies. The detectives and the officers that investigate these are professionals and they're very good at what they do. So. If the FBI is involved, let's say it's a bank robbery because banks are federally insured. If it's just, and most bank robberies in most cities is somebody with a demand note, give me the money, they're not saying anything. And the tellers are trained just to comply because 
it's not where somebody get hurt over. You know, right. it's all insured anyways. And uh, that's the end of it. But if it gets more dynamic and there's gunplay, they're shooting guns off, or they're if they actually shoot somebody, the FBI will respond. Mm-hmm. And is and also if you have bank robbers that are going from city to city to city, you know, they track all of that. It's like okay, you know what? It's uh, a white male wearing a purple T-shirt. That you know, <laughs> oh, nice. so you <laughs> yeah, saw me so, earlier. So you know, like the same type of weapon. They're saying the same thing. So this could be a crew. Yeah. And that's people trying to deliberately exploit the jurisdictions yes. and the county lines, as they sure. call them. Yeah. So the FBI would be involved with that. Also, human trafficking. Yeah. Our sensitive crimes division works hand in hand with the FBI with human trafficking because oftentimes human trafficking goes across state borders, goes across state lines. Okay. So, end of your career. Is there a case, an incident you look back on that you're most pleased with? Oh, boy. I've had a couple of people, well, more than a couple, that have tried to kill themselves in front of me. I was literally on a bridge, and there were, they demolished the bridge, and they're rebuilding it, and they didn't put up a fence to block it. There was a bunch of cones and some like barriers, but anybody could just walk by there. And the sheriff's department called for an assist for a man jumping off the bridge. I'm like, okay. So we get there. It's pouring rain. And it was me and um, another sergeant. It was probably three, four o'clock in the morning. And the two sheriff's deputies are talking to this guy, and they were real close to him. And this guy had his back to the highway. This bridge was over a highway. If he would have fell, he'd be dead. And he was probably about six foot four, six foot five, good 300 pounds, not wearing a shirt and skinny jeans. And the first thing I'm thinking is like, there's nothing to grab onto. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, man. And I've negotiated with suicidal people a bunch of times. And my cops have, too. And this guy was just, he wasn't having it. Finally, this sheriff's deputy grabs his belt underneath the fat. And now it's talk of war time. And I'm like, oh, God. So I got to help him out. So I jumped on my stomach and just grabbed a hold of this guy's legs. And at the same time, my head was over the bridge and I was looking at the traffic going by. And I was getting vertigo. And I'm just like, oh, God, I hope these guys, because I don't know if I'm going to be able to hold on to this guy if he goes that way. Yeah. So it was pretty tense there for a while. But you got him back. Mm-hmm. And is there anything that's happened? Is there somebody who you just never caught one case that's going to bug you a little bit as you... No, because... I just get it out of my head. It's just another day and there's going to be another one the next day. We're a busy enough city where there's no shortage of crime and there's no shortage of instances of where you're going to go and it's stressful and you've got this thing, whatever it is. And it's like just another day. And do you keep your faith in humanity up? Because you, you can't, you spend 30 years being called out to low moments in people's lives, extreme moments. It's got to be, it's got to shake you a little bit, hasn't it? And it, shake your faith in humanity, as I say. It does, and it can if you let it. I don't, or at least I try not to. I mean, my wife might say different. But you have to look, even in the worst neighborhoods, you know, a few years back, our city was on fire. We had a huge riot that lasted three nights, four nights. Even when they were throwing rocks and stones and bottles at us, there's still people come out. Would you like a bottle of water, officer? This is in the same neighborhoods. Not everybody in that neighborhood is a bad person. But when you work at night, you kind of have it in your head because, you know, you got to be, first of all, you're on your highest guard. You don't want anything happening to yourself. But there are good people. You know, once you go day shift, you kind of see a little bit of the other side of humanity. At night, most of the people we dealt with are drunk or high or whatever. People aren't calling you when they're having the best day of their life. But, I mean, what sticks in my head, I remember one time I responded to a completed uh, suicide. Husband and wife had a fight the night before. He got up in the morning, didn't say a thing to his wife. Went out in the garage and she heard a bang. He shot himself in the head with a shotgun. It was grisly. 
Excuse me one second. Yeah, sure. So he shoots himself in the head with a shotgun, and his wife was just obviously devastated. And it was a nice summer day, and we were sitting in her backyard. On, she had a nice patio set, and I remember I held her hand for over an hour and just consoled her until friends and family could come over and mm. take over. You couldn't leave her, could you? No. Lord, no. But we still have to do an investigation. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's it looked very obvious, but even things that look obvious, yeah. aren't. that's not the way it happened. Yeah. Yeah, and well, that's a terrible real real life story. But as writers, you're always always thinking about plots, aren't you? Where it turns out right. not to be what it looked like, which does happen, of it, course. Occasionally, it does. And you've got to be aware of that, right? Um, Patrick, it's compelling talking to you. It always has been. Uh, in the chats we've had, I'm so pleased we've got some time to sit down together and put this on tape. Thank you. You better tell people where they can find you, where they can find your instruction manuals for, for writers. <laughs> well, right now, um, I do have a website www.copsandwriters.com I do have the Facebook group Cops and Writers there's other members of law enforcement that are on there a lot of writers it's a nice little tribe I got about 950 people in that group and I put that group together before I wrote the book so I dug the well before I was thirsty yeah which is a great way of doing it yep superb well Patrick finally I want to say thank you for your services just a couple of months ahead of your final retirement thank you Thank you for the time you put in on the streets where you stand you stand between us and people who uh, who will do us harm. I appreciate that. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go. Great interview. I absolutely loved talking to Patrick and utmost respect to uh, to someone. You know, we do have to have respect for those people who put themselves in harm's way for us. We've just had a you know worldwide uh, famous incident on London Bridge where um, not only policemen ran to the scene and, and, and got involved, but members of the public armed with a gnarled we shouldn't, tusk. We shouldn't laugh. But there's a really funny meme going around after that. So, so for those who don't know, there was a, a guy... Um, uh, Pulled, had a couple of knives and a, and a fake suicide vest, and he um, he stabbed two, killed two people um, on London Bridge, and then ran onto the bridge and started attacking pedestrians. Chased by um, a Polish chef um, from the place where he was, and I think other members of staff, including um, a convicted, convicted murderer, two two convicted murderers um, who were at this conference about rehabilitation. Um, basically, you know, put their own lives at risk to uh, take this guy down. And um, there's a very funny meme that these these guys were armed with a narwhal tusk, which is mm. like a, a five foot long, um, I suppose, ivory um, tusk from well, obviously from a, a narwhal, and and a fire extinguisher. And there's a scene whereby um, you got these guys. There's fire extinguishers going off. The guy is prodding with this tusk. There's this photograph, um, and the caption is um, something. Oh, uh, something about uh, uh, Americans getting guns. You know, basically, hold, yes. hold, hold my beer, Britain says. <laughs> yeah. I'll get yeah. my narwhal tusk. Um, you've, so, you've got you know, assault rifles. We have not. You know, I, before this incident, I wasn't 100% sure whether narwhal was a real thing. It was just made up for Elf, the uh, movie. Well, no, they are. Yes, they are real. And and then, of course, the um, well, the denouement to that was the, the police arrived. I think they were very close. It was an armed response vehicle. It was It, it was very close by. And the, these guys came out, came out with um, assault rifles. And um, the public wouldn't... They, they wouldn't get off this guy. There was one of the guys who was basically pinning him down. Yeah. Wouldn't get yeah. off. The police... The guy then managed to open his jacket to show the fake suicide vest. The police immediately pulled back. Um, one of the other policemen, again, risking their lives, because he could have had a bomb yank this member of the public off this guy and then the next thing he just shoots him um yeah so but that's incredible bravery i mean that's um really remarkable from everyone really um from the the pedestrians and, and also obviously from the police yeah and uh, talking to patrick about those it, being in that moment it was very interesting to hear him talking about it because there's i mean there was footage for that it's not quite as gruesome as it, it sounds but it's not it's, it's quite thing. it's quite gruesome yeah it's yeah. quite full on i wouldn't go searching for it if you're no. of a nervous disposition but um so that policeman first of all you know, the guys who are armed, they run to the scene of what, for as far as they're concerned, is somebody wearing a suicide vest, and that's confirmed to them. And the next thing is they then take the decision instantly to shoot him, which is the correct thing because that's the pr- protocol for somebody, you know, in the middle of a public area with a suicide vest on. Um, but that's still a big decision. And we still rely, we still require them 
to in that moment make that decision to follow that procedure mm. follow that training and that's the sort of thing that's you know we talked to patrick about in that interview i was fascinated listening to to him talking about that and um yeah all, all due respect to them and that will that will likely will haunt that officer it will be something he he may need to speak to someone about and that that's maybe not but it's not wouldn't surprise me that that kind of decision is something that that he may have sleepless nights over entirely possible um but no that brings me back to um, what i was i said before the interview with um the new Atticus book i think i mentioned this on the podcast a while ago because um i had a um in fact i know i did because um neil lancaster who's a detective sergeant in in the met has been helping me a lot with um the uh the first draft of Atticus um and um he told me he got quite excited when he heard his name on the podcast. So there we go. He's getting a second, um, a second shout out right now. Hello, but, Neil. Yeah, Neil, Neil's great and also a very you know good writer in his, his own right. But he's helped me a lot with kind of layering little bits of um, information and authenticity onto the police scenes. That obviously, I, I have no other experience of. Um, but it, it's it's really what I'm trying to say is is to get someone like that from Patrick to Neil to other people who you might know who work in and it doesn't have to be police just could be a, a, an area that you're writing about to have someone uh, being able to give you the little bits of detail that you can sprinkle over and one of the tricks is is, is I think I've mentioned this before as well is it's not to have great big um you know, talk about the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which there, there are certain, Neil told me, obviously I'm a lawyer as well, so I knew some of this, but Neil was explaining what you would need to do in order for evidence to be admissible in court. And Atticus is obviously, he's a maverick, and some of the ways he uses to find his evidence wouldn't stand up in court. So Neil was like, if a policeman, you know, this this would not work. And, and so Neil would tell me how I would, I should do it. Now, the interesting bit there was, um, first of all, I, I, I couldn't, you know, put in, well, Attica says, the Police and Criminal Ev- Evidence Act, Section 87, uh, Subclause 3, says that. You can't do that, and you can't kind of demonstrate how much you know about a subject. And the real skill is, and it's something that I've had to work quite hard to get right, is just to layer in just the the, the lightest sprinkling of that information. So what, what you, you want to give the... The analogy is it's an iceberg. So you, you you show the reader the tip of the iceberg. So you, the, the the very smallest amount that you can to um, to give them the impression that you know what you're talking about. And then beneath the surface of the water is the is your research. So that's you're not showing all of that because that would just completely well you know to continue a slightly stretched metaphor it would, that would. If your narrative is the Titanic the and, and, you, and you whack into the iceberg because you're basically <laughs> too much okay. info dumping, that wouldn't work. So um, there is a skill to that. But anyway, that's people like Patrick and, and Neil are, are gold dust for writers trying to make things as authentic as possible. And I think you talk about pace there, which is the UK Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which sort of is the, the millstone round uh, law enforcement officers next in this country because it's very detailed. And if you make mistakes at the very early stage of a... Um, a prosecution it comes back to haunt you very quickly in court and you murderers can walk free as a result of that so they have to that they, they have to get all this stuff right and I think that's another kind of reality which you 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 will bring in I'm sure to the Atticus books and, and is you know is, is often missing though particularly on TV where there's this sort of maverickness to the way the police operates on TV quite a lot of time even sort of cop shows where they swanter in and they grab people and they don't read them rights or they do read them rights and they throw them in jail. And there's none of this. If we make a mistake now, we say the wrong thing. If we arrest him too early, we run out of time to question him and that would go to a judge to get permission to bring him back. You've got to build your case. People don't realize this. In the UK, and I'm sure it's a similar system, justice in America, you arrest somebody for murder, you've got about 24 hours, 48 hours at a stretch to build your case that nine, 10 months later is going to be presented in court. And you can't add to it in a month's time without mm. permission, without going around corners. This is the reality of being a police officer, which is not yeah, often... Yeah, that's, that's right. But then there's been two things on that. I mean, if, if you're accused of being a murderer, you're quite pleased that the, the pace exists. Um, so yes. it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a millstone. It's, it's, a, it's something that you have to kind of deal with, but and, and it's there to protect you and, and the public. The other thing is um, the kind of the interesting discussion I had with Neil was that um, on the one hand, he is telling me everything that I would need to include in order to be authentic. And I'm approaching... And I'm very keen on authenticity. But what I'm also keen on, in fact, what I'm more keen on is that the dr- dramatic um, propulsion is not 
slowed down too much by being too authentic and and kind of stretch slightly further i mean yeah i am i am not writing a criminal textbook i'm writing something that's intended to be fairly disposable escapist fiction so it's it's, it's always a tension and a balance between realism and escapism and drama and you've got to find you've got to find a happy medium somewhere in the middle i usually get it right i think but it, it is it is tricky sometimes yeah Good. Well, good luck with what is the timetable on Atticus now? Well, we will have to talk about that in a separate episode, I think. I'm getting quite a lot of interest from... I just had a call with my agent before we came on, and um, I've had one party very interested in in publishing it, possibly under a pseudonym for lots of different reasons. I've had a six-figure offer just for the audio, um, which is very you know amazing. I'm very flattered by that. I've had another aud- another audio offer, the, offer coming in, Still in the back of my mind, I think that I'll publish it myself. Um, mm-hmm. You know, someone, as I said before, if someone offers me six hundred thousand dollars for it. Mm. I, I might be interested in exploring that, but um, I, I think I can probably beat that over the course of a couple of years with with a series doing it myself. So, and I like doing it myself. So, I think at the moment it looks like it will launch on uh, February twenty eighth. I think next next year. So I'm starting okay. to get the kind of ad assets ready for that now, and we we can have a chat about what I do on that one a bit further. Yeah, on. well, why don't we uh, why don't we try and do an episode on on you know creating a new genre and mm-hmm. uh, creating a new marketing uh, buzz around all that, and a new pen name, same pen name. We'll see. Probably, if I do okay. it myself, definitely. If it's published by somebody else, I may have to do it under pseudonym. I think you should go for J T Dawson. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Barry Hutchinson's got J D. Exactly. Wish. Is oh uh, no, not um, JD Kirk. JD Kirk, of course, yeah. JT Kirk. JT well. Kirk, yeah. <laughs> no, there's uh, there's we can another thing we could talk about. There's someone else in the uh, the kind of Barry and me and Louise Ross um have been chatting about someone else who is um purloining, shall we say, um yes. certain aspects of covers and series and, and, and I think doing quite well, but it's yes. but it's pretty flagrant um it's not it's not even certain aspects in some he, cases it's he like might get almost an identikit isn't it it's pretty it's pretty flagrant i i i yeah. would have i would have sued him by now um but then i'm i'm a cantankerous old bastard um Louise, if you want to know what we're talking about if you search on those authors you'll probably see this other book because he advertises he's on my books now as well so i, I think yeah. he may be a student which is you know, yes. with you know with great response with great power comes great responsibility yes. and um he's yeah he should probably be careful karma is right. a bitch sometimes Maybe that's another episode for us, ethics at some point. Um, just, just next to, uh, just below Suffolk and um, next, oh, eth- <laughs> ethics, sorry. I thought you said Essex, sorry. <laughs> sorry, American <laughs> listeners, you don't know what I'm talking about. It was okay, a very bad joke. Look, that is it. I want to say a big thank you to Patrick O'Donnell uh, and thank you for your service, Patrick, in the uh, in the police force, um, keeping the streets safe. Um, oh, we Patrick, you- I just like to have a message to Patrick. Next time he bumps into, next time he bumps into James <laughs> at a conference, he's just asked me off camera if you could arrest him. Um, he wants to experience the criminal <laughs> justice up, system. Mark. No, I haven't said that, Patrick. Don't. He'll be out of uniform anyway next time I meet him uh, and safely into his writing career. And we wish him the best with that. Okay, thank you very much. It leaves us to say sort of happy Christmas to everyone. Happy Hanukkah. Okay, if uh, that's what you want, then happy, bewildering few days off if it's um, n- not your culture or religion at all. Careful, James. Um, I- I'm going to wrap this up I- before, you- before you go full partridge. So I, I will <laughs> say uh, love. Um, I'd say it's a happy Christmas from uh, me and a happy Christmas from him. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.